Down through the years, Nash has built a great record of progress. A record of pioneering, of daring to be different. A record of research, engineering, design and construction that has resulted in automotive advancements that were inevitably imitated by other manufacturers. For Nash, the free-thinking independent, has always kept ahead of the industry. Now a new chapter of this history is being written. For now, in the model year of 1951, Nash presents its newest and finest Nash achievement. The world's most modern car. In 1951, Nash tells the world of a car that, like its predecessors, is years ahead of competition. Ahead in style and beauty. Ahead in comfort and convenience. Ahead in safety. In economy. And in performance. Yes, this is the story of a motor car of surpassing excellence in all the features that catch the public fancy. But for a moment, Let's go behind that story. Let's hear the cold, hard facts that prove the Nash Air Flight to be the world's most modern car. First, let's hear and see the facts about style and beauty. The facts about Nash style and beauty pretty well speak for themselves, but let me point out a few of the highlights. The functional aerodynamic lines of the distinctive 1950 Air Flights have been basically retained. However, new treatments, new details, make this model even more strikingly beautiful. For example, the new treatment of grille, lights, and bumper is a symphony of unified design. Notice the massive vertical convex bars of the grille, the single broad lens behind which are housed both parking and directional signal lights, and the distinctive chrome ring which frames the headlight and protects the lens. For this year, there is a sharp distinction in exterior trim between the statesman and the ambassador. In 1951, the ambassador has a wide chromium bead sweeping back from the parking lights to the nameplate. New bumper guards with massive bullet-shaped tops and sturdy new fender guards provide the ambassador with distinctive identification. A truly outstanding change is the new rear-end design. It features a striking new fender whose ridge line starts at the rear door and sweeps in a graceful horizontal curve to its termination in the rear lighting unit. The rear bumper and guards have the same massive treatment found at the front. But notice in particular the widely spaced rear lights. Here in a single unit, mounted in each rear fender, are the directional tail and stop lights. And a handsome new escutcheon in the rear deck houses the flush type trunk handle and the license plate lights. The modern design of the new rear end styling adds a truly eye-catching accent to the beauty of the 1951 air flight. Another thrill that awaits the style-conscious person is the new Air Flight's interior. The new instrument panel is a triumph of clean, modern design. Instruments and controls are centered in a handsome chromium band, which spans the width of the car. The driving instruments themselves are grouped in a hooded dial, which contrasts tastefully with the instrument panel in contour and in color. The graceful steering wheel and the hydromatic or gear shift control are handsomely mounted on a massive steering column. Other interior appointments are tailored to match. The new custom interiors are the last word in automotive luxury. Both fabrics and hardware have been selected to offer the utmost in beauty and utility. And this year, the Super Series offers seven different upholstery fabrics and colors in broadcloth, mohair, nylon, and tweed. Twenty-one different upholstery combinations. The facts, as we have seen them, leave no doubt that the 1951 Nash Air Flight is the world's most modern car in style and beauty. But we have also said that Nash leads the world in comfort and convenience. So let's hear the proof of that. Let's go behind that story and hear the actual facts about comfort and convenience. Many of the great Nash comfort features of previous years have been retained and improved for 1951. Many fine new features have been added. Again, Nash presents the luxury of coil springs on all four wheels, providing the softest and smoothest ride known to modern engineers. 
This year, new Nash engineered shock absorbers with an entirely new valving system give a better ride and a firmer feel. And they maintain ride control whether hot or cold. The ride is even further improved by the luxurious comfort of wide, deep seats with optional foam rubber cushions. The ultimate in luxury is the exclusive Nash Airliner reclining front seat, quickly adjustable to any of five positions for lounging in extreme comfort. And once again, the famous convertible double bed can make any Nash into a traveling master bedroom. This year, a brilliant and much imitated Nash original the incomparable weather-eye conditioned air system is even further improved. Air passages and deflectors have been changed to provide a greater flow of air, particularly at low speeds, to all parts of the passenger compartment. As for convenience, there are many fine features. The instrument panel, for example, is not only beautiful, but is designed to make all controls convenient to the driver with the very least motion and all instruments visible at a glance. The new Nash radio is a masterpiece. For greater convenience, stations are tuned by individual push buttons, equally accessible to driver or passenger. And the front speaker is now mounted behind a handsome chromium grille on the instrument panel. In this position, tone quality is much improved. The Nash rear speaker with separate control is again available for those who demand the ultimate in sound reproduction. Then there are a multitude of other conveniences which make Nash outstanding. The convenience of the custom courtesy lights under the instrument panel at each side, which go on automatically when a door is opened. The convenience of the exclusive Nash sliding drawer glove compartment with its automatic light. And the convenience of the great roomy trunk with its easily accessible vertically mounted spare tire. All of these features add up to prove that Nash is, in fact, the world's most modern car in comfort and convenience. Facts like these are indeed enough, but there is more, much more. So now let's examine our claim that in safety, the 1951 Nash Air Flight is far ahead. Let's look at the facts that lie behind that story. Nash has always had a reputation as one of the world's safest cars. And in the new 1951 Air Flights, the features which built that reputation are retained. For example, the engineering miracle of air flight construction with its rugged one-piece body and frame again brings the greatest measure of protection to Nash passengers. And again, Nash has the all-around visibility of a control tower with its wide, curving one-piece windshield, its sweeping expanse of rear window glass, and its large, clear side windows. To these great safety features of the past have been added some impressive new refinements. The new position of tail and stoplights, for example, is far more than a beauty feature. Wide spaced as they are, they show the full width of the car to a following driver, nor is his vision of them easily blocked by other vehicles. The same is true of the beautiful new instrument panel. Increased safety is assured by the quick readability of the instrument gauges, and the hooded instrument housing prevents light reflections that might prove dangerous. The sure ease of control offered by the new 20 to 1 steering ratio is already familiar to recent owners of 1950 Nash cars. But for 1951, a new enclosed threaded type knuckle pin provides better alignment and even easier steering, particularly when making turns. Of particular interest to those who have children is the new arrangement of door handles. Instead of pushing down or forward to open the door, you must now lift the handle. This, of course, prevents accidental opening of the doors while the car is in motion. This is but another of the features which altogether make Nash the world's most modern car in safety. And a compelling safety story it is. But what about our story on the economy of the 1951 air flights? What are the cold, hard facts behind that story? If there is one feature for which Nash is particularly famous, one feature which competition has tried to imitate more than any other, that feature is the amazing fuel economy which Nash has achieved while still maintaining full size and sparkling performance. Again, for 1951, the statesman and the ambassador maintain their leadership in this all-important phase of automotive engineering. For this year, both series offer a revolutionary new vacuum booster fuel pump, already proved in action on the Rambler.
which features a new diaphragm that operates more efficiently and quietly than ever before. In addition, a brand new carburetor is now featured on the Statesman. Still employing the original Nash principle of Uniflow jet carburation, the new carburetor's simplified design provides more accurate metering of fuel for all conditions of engine load and temperature. With these new improvements, Nash again leads the way with the world's most modern car in economy. There can be no doubt of that fact. Therefore, let's consider our final claim, leadership in performance. Let's see and hear the facts about 1951 Nash performance. Both the Ambassador and the Statesman, long known for flashing dependable performance, are now further improved. For this year, the Ambassador's famous 115 horsepower engine features a great new development, waterproof ignition. Yes, you can turn the hose on this new engine and it will start quickly and run smoothly. This is because the ignition system is protected from dust and water by waterproof, long-lived, crack-free neoprene. Neoprene insulation on the high-tension wiring neoprene caps over the spark plug insulators. Further protection is provided by vinylite nipples, which seal the coil and distributor against dust and moisture. Also for 1951, all Nash cars equipped with hydromatic drive offer a fine new feature, a one-piece tubular propeller shaft which provides smooth, whipless transmission of power to the rear wheels. Then there are other changes which contribute to performance. Crankcase ventilation has been improved at all speeds. This means a cleaner, better lubricated, smoother operating engine. The new valve system, introduced on late 1950 Ambassadors, offers a big gain in overall engine performance, plus far quieter operation than has been possible before. Furthermore, the quiet, efficient new fuel pump contributes measurably to performance and long, trouble-free engine life. The Statesman's great 85 horsepower L-head engine has also been improved. It, too, has that fine new contribution to engine performance, waterproof ignition, with its guarantee of fast, sure starting and smooth running under conditions in which other engines may be dead or misfiring. The Statesman, too, has the new fuel pump's quietness, efficiency, and durability, plus the lubrication and operating benefits of the improved crankcase ventilating system. Furthermore, the Statesman's great new carburetor, with its accurate metering of fuel, provides faster, smoother acceleration and performance, as well as greater economy. And this year, the Statesman offers another new feature of importance, a new starter drive which assures quick, sure starts in cold weather. Instead of disengaging and spinning freely the first time a cylinder fires, the new drive remains engaged through the intermittent firing of cold starts until the engine catches hold and runs under its own power. Finally, the Statesman boasts a new radiator core, narrower and more effectively covered by the fan. The new core features 10 cooling fins per inch instead of the previous 8 per inch. This means more efficient cooling and therefore trouble-free engine operation under all conditions. These features are enough to make the Statesman the outstanding performer in its class, but that's only the beginning, for the real news is this. The Statesman now offers hydromatic drive. Yes, for 1951, Nash brings to the lower price field the miraculous driving simplicity of this truly great automatic transmission. With this addition, Nash now offers three options on both Ambassador and Statesman series. Standard three-speed transmission, overdrive, or hydromatic. That, in brief, is the factual support of the statement that, in performance, too, Nash is the world's most modern car. Yes, those are the facts behind the story a nation will see and hear in 1951. The facts about the new Nash Air Flight Ambassador and the facts about the new Nash Air Flight Statesman. Two great cars joined by the 1951 Nash Rambler as the newest and finest members of a family of distinguished motor cars. These facts prove beyond a doubt that in every quality car buyers want and look for, in every buying appeal, style and beauty, comfort and convenience, safety, economy, and performance. Nash is supreme. That Nash is, in fact, the world's most modern car.
is a part of tomorrow. And that tomorrow is here today. Part of tomorrow? Here today? Let's examine that claim. Let's examine that claim to prove that the Rambler series is, in fact, part and parcel of today's living. Let's deal in facts. Over 80 million miles of owner experience in the first nine months give us at Nash solid proof of enthusiastic Rambler acceptance through Rambler owner use. Still years ahead in design features. Yes, still an entirely new motor car concept. Tomorrow style today. Ten custom features still sold as extras by others. But all of that is only part of the story. Because thousands of Rambler-owning Americans now know that the Rambler station wagon and convertible sedan are in fact all-purpose automobiles that play an important part in today's mobile living. These proud Rambler owners know that the Rambler is a compact car, a car that's easy to handle in today's congested traffic, easy to park in today's crowded streets. They know the Nash Rambler is a roomy car, seating five passengers in spacious comfort. They know it's a snappy performer in packed traffic and on the open highway, with fast getaway and smooth high-speed cruising. It's a safe car, air flight construction and rugged steel girders above, below, and all around the passenger compartment make the station wagon and the convertible the safest of all automobiles of these body types. The Rambler is a luxurious car, tailored to today's standard of living. It includes, as standard equipment, all the custom appointments and accessories most wanted by automobile buyers. These include weather eye, radio, direction signals, chrome wheel discs, foam rubber cushions, custom upholstery, custom steering wheel, electric clock, courtesy lights, custom carpeting, all at no extra cost. It's a weather-tight car. In the station wagon or the convertible, all welded one-piece construction seals drafts and cold weather out while the incomparable weather eye keeps the inside warm and comfortable. It's a quiet automobile. Once again, rock-solid air flight construction ensures against structural rattles throughout the long life of the car. Both models are truly all-purpose automobiles, versatile and efficient however they are used. For example, the custom convertible sedan is a thrilling open-air car, caressed by sunshine and warm summer breezes. And when weather requires, it's a snug, draft, snow, and rainproof sedan, as warm and secure as any closed car on the road. And the station wagon is at one time a handsome, roomy, comfortable sedan, and at another, a versatile load carrier with lots of accessible space for vacation travel, business use, or hunting and camping trips. Yes, we can all tell the world that now it is possible to enjoy the advantages of two cars with a one-car investment. Yes, possible with only one car to enjoy both the protection and comfort of a closed family car and the thrill and satisfaction of a specially styled convertible or station wagon. Finally, the Nash Ramblers are the most economical full-size cars on the market today. From the standpoint of initial cost, the Rambler convertible sedan is America's lowest price convertible, including nearly $300 worth of custom accessories and features usually billed extra to the buyer. And the Rambler station wagon is the lowest priced, full-size custom station wagon on the market today. From the standpoint of cost of upkeep, many Rambler owners get 30 miles and even more to a gallon, compared to the normal cars 12 to 18. Thus, a Rambler owner may get double the average mileage. Therefore, if a car owner normally spends $250 a year for gasoline, with a Rambler, he could easily put 125 of those dollars in his pocket. Yes, in days like these, when the emphasis is on conservation of vital materials, when costs are high and taxes and credit restrictions reduce consumer buying power, when gasoline itself may be in short supply due to military needs, in days like these, the Rambler is beyond dispute a car geared to the times. It is, in fact, a wholly new motoring concept because, for the first time, it brings the distinction, the styling, and the pleasure of these body types to a vast new segment of the car buying public, people who have never before been able to buy such cars. In fact, the letters Nash gets from Rambler owners prove that both cars have tremendous appeal for Americans in all walks of life. Instead of bringing these owners to you in person, this series of realistic skits will represent them for us. Let's hear what they have to say. To begin with, 
Here's Stanley Kowalski, a man of modest income, but with a justified longing for things that are nice. But let Stanley tell us about that himself. I don't kid myself that my take-home pay is enough to buy two cars. The wife and I always been a one-car family. And that one car always had to be, well, an ordinary sedan. For sure, like most guys, I've always had the dream in my eye for a convertible job. But when you've got to make one car do all year round for several years, well, a convertible is kind of out of the question. It was, that is, until I bought my Nash Rambler. Now I've got a nifty convertible like I always wanted. And at the same time, I've got a sedan that keeps old man winter out as good as any sedan ever did. And it's a lot easier on my pocketbook than any car I ever drove. That's one happy Rambler owner heard from. Let's hear now from another man. I'm Dr. Eugene Billings. My family has been a two-car family for a good many years. You see, my home is out in the Cloverdale section and my practice is downtown. So I need a car to get back and forth to my office. Mrs. Billings also needs a car to run the children to school, do her shopping, go to bridge parties. You know, the silly little things a woman spends her time at. And frankly, I'm just a little bit jealous of that Rambler station wagon of hers. It handles so easily in traffic that on the rare time she lets me use it, I don't want to give it up. More than that, it's got everything my big heavy sedan has, and a lot more class besides. No wonder my wife and children are so proud of that car. Or take Joe Impossimato. He's a small grocer, but let him tell it himself. Did you ever try to pile in at the missus a three of bambinos and two dogs in a panel truck for a day out of the city? <laughs> well, que uh, accidente, it's no fun. I'm uh, telling you. See, that's uh, the way it used to be. Ah, mamma mia. But that's all finished now. Like uh, Io Dicevo, uh, uh, like I was saying, now I got uh, the Rambler station wagon to make uh, the delivery from uh, the store, and on a Sunday, I got a real automobile for the familia. Ah, que bella. And the price, uh, she's right, too. Now listen to the case of the Bensons. They're a typical family group. Mr. and Mrs. and two little tykes. Here, Mrs. Benson can talk for the family. Usually does, anyway. Bob and I have always wanted a convertible. The kids, too. Frankly, we can afford just about any car we want, but we've never bought a convertible. Well, like I used to tell Bob, Bob, I'd say, what if one of the kids were thrown out of the car? Wouldn't you feel just awful, I'd say? And he'd just have to agree with me, didn't you, Bob? Didn't you just have to agree with me? Yes, dear, I just had to agree with you. But things have changed now. We cruise along in our Rambler convertible and just know that our children will stay where we put them. Isn't that right, Bob? Yes, dear, that, that's right, dear. And another thing, that overhead construction makes it possible for me to keep right on talking to Bob as we drive along with the top down. I couldn't do that in the old-fashioned kind and expect him to hear me above all the squeaks and rattles and wind, could I, Bob? Yes, dear. Uh, I mean, no, dear. Or take Cyrus Gordon. He's a farmer and a darn good one. Around the farm, this Rambler station wagon is an unbeatable combination. Two cars in one, small truck for little chores round and about, a pretty snazzy sedan for taking the family to town Saturdays. You know, I can't recollect the last time I put any gas in that car. Or how about beating up with, you'll excuse the expression, a traveling salesman? Bill Jennings is the name. I drive my own car around the territory. That's most of the state. And, of course, I have to carry quite a few samples, display and promotion pieces, things like that. So, naturally, I'm pretty well pleased with my Rambler station wagon for several reasons. In the first place, I can carry all the things I have to carry and get them in and out of the car very easily. Then, too, I like the way that car handles on the highway, really hugs the road and cruises along like a big sedan. That's important when you're traveling country highways quite a bit. And finally, just between us, the mileage I get out of that Rambler really stretches my expense allowance a long, long way. The only drawback is 
The boss knows about it. Now he's thinking of equipping all of us with company-owned Rambler station wagons. Next customer, Miss Jenny Whitehill. One would hardly expect a spinster of her dignified years to be driving a convertible. But uh, let's let her tell us about that. I've been driving my electric for 24 years come July 16. I've begun to think I'd keep on driving it the rest of my natural life. Especially when I saw the way they've been building cars lately. So big and heavy and bulky. Does too much for me to handle. Then I saw the Rambler. And land sakes, I knew instantly that was the car for me. So compact, so light, so easy to handle. And so beautifully appointed inside. Now, uh, I realize that many people may think that it's perhaps, uh, shall we say, a little too dashing for me. But, well, frankly, I like it. <laughs> perhaps it's just my second childhood. And so it goes. If you try to determine just who is a logical customer for this new type of car, you'll find that the list goes on and on endlessly. There's the conservative one-car family, the professional and executive family with two or more cars, the farmer, the rancher, the small businessman, the young and the old. Yes, as a Nash salesman, there's your market. Thousands of people who have felt the need for a car that meets all their transportation needs. Thousands of people just waiting for you to tell them, to tell them the story of all-purpose, all-weather transportation. Many will immediately recognize the Rambler as the car they have been waiting for. Others will need to be shown just how it meets their needs. But you are salesmen, skilled in showing buyers how your product does meet their needs. Remember this, you are not selling just another station wagon or convertible. You are selling an all-purpose sedan, an all-weather convertible. Cars that will give new pleasure, new convenience, new usefulness to thousands of people. Yes, there are big earnings in this new market for Nash salesmen, salesmen who will go after the business. There is, in fact, no limit to the profit possibilities for any salesman who will recognize and develop this tremendous new market. The salesman who will promote and sell these great new automobiles the 1951 Rambler Custom Convertible All-Weather Sedan and the Rambler Station Wagon All-Purpose Sedan. I just wanted to see you again, George, and talk a few things over. See what you're doing about the situation. With shortages and all that, it's not so easy to plan ahead. I understand you've worked out some answers here that may be just what I need in my dealership. Well, I'm glad you came to town, Carl. We have done a few things around here that I'll be glad to tell you about. Let me go back to the beginning. Here's what started me thinking. A few years ago, we sold a new car to Doc Brown. He's a druggist here in town. There was nothing unusual about the deal. That is, I didn't see anything unusual at that time. But we made a very good service customer out of Doc. In fact, he told me that my service department was the only place that ever took care of his car. And I'm sure that was so. When he wanted another new car, he gave us a chance to serve him again because we'd worked to keep in touch with him and had kept him satisfied. Naturally, we could give him a very nice allowance because we knew the car had been well taken care of and was a good, clean piece of merchandise. A car like that's always easy to sell. As a matter of fact, it was bought by one of Doc Brown's neighbors because the buyer knew it had been well taken care of, too. Say, that was a good deal, wasn't it? Yeah, but that wasn't the best part of it, Carl. Here's what happened. We checked our service records on that car. I was curious to know how much service business a dealer could do if he took care of all the customer's needs. And the surprising thing about it was this. The gross profit from servicing Doc's car for a few years approached the profit I had made on the new car sale. 
If every Nash in my territory would provide the service and parts gross that Doc Brown's car did, I'd have no trouble absorbing 100% of my fixed expenses. And of course, there's service from other makes too. And checking our service records some more, I analyzed how we made out with other cars sold around the same time as Doc Brown's. One case will serve as an example of what happened to some of them. As a new car sale, this one was about as good a deal for us as the other one. But that's about as far as it went. Oh, sure, we got the owner back at first for his inspections and adjustments. But after that, our records showed that he began to drift away. Later on, I found out why. He had his car lubricated at the neighborhood filling station because it was convenient and he didn't have to go far. Then he had a lot of his adjustments and tune-ups done by independent repair shops. He either knew someone there or he figured he'd get a lower price. We generally saw his car when it needed repairs because the owner realized that we have the tools and the trained mechanics to do an important job right. Like Doc Brown, this owner traded his car in for a new one too. But he didn't trade it to me. He had gotten away because we hadn't done enough to keep him coming back. If my service gross depended on cars like that one, I'd have a mighty small percentage of my fixed expenses absorbed through service. By further analyzing our records, by talking with other dealers around town, by keeping my finger on the pulse of national surveys, I came to this conclusion. In my territory, there's enough service and parts gross to take care of my overhead if we get enough people in and treat them right when we serve them. Of course, we can't get them all, but we try to attract at least 50% of all Nash owners in our territory into becoming regular service customers. The upper bracket that will buy new and used cars. Now, wait a minute, George. A dealer would have a tough time taking care of all that business, even if he could get it, wouldn't he? With proper charging of expenses, I absorb only half of my overhead, even when my place is busy. How can you get more gross out of a shop when you can hardly handle the work you're doing? Yeah, I know, Carl. That's what bothered me to start with. But I found the answer to that in two words. Shop efficiency. Shop efficiency? Well, I think my boys do a pretty good job of handling the work. Well, maybe so, Carl. But that's what I thought about this place till I applied a little more business management to the service department. Let me tell you how I figured out my shop efficiency. If every mechanic stall produced eight hours of labor sales in an eight-hour day, that would mean that the shop had 100% efficiency. Of course, you have to allow time for the mechanic to get parts and things like that, so each man's stall will actually produce around seven hours labor sales a day, roughly 85% of an eight-hour day. If seven hours of labor sales are produced for every stall in the service department, the shop is better than 85% efficient, and that's a good mark to shoot at. Now, here's what we found. In our service department, we had eight stalls that should have been productive. With eight hours labor a day per stall, we had potential labor sales of 64 hours a day. That is, if we could be 100% efficient. In other words, the number of stalls times the hours per day equals your daily potential of labor hours. To convert that into dollars, you multiply by your hourly rate. In our case, even though we had eight stalls, we were employing only seven mechanics. Part of our space was entirely non-productive. On top of that, our seven men were averaging only six hours of labor sales a day, for a total of 42 hours. Since our labor sales were only 42 hours, and our labor potential was 64, our shop efficiency was only about 66%. You can figure your own efficiency by using the same formula. In other words, Carl, labor sales actual divided by labor sales potential equals the percent of shop efficiency in any service department. Now, I figured out that if we could increase our labor sales from 42 hours to 56 hours, we would gain these advantages. We would increase our labor sales by one-third merely by making more effective use of the space and facilities we already have. And we would increase our shop efficiency from a poor 66% to 85% where it should be. Furthermore, if we could increase our labor sales and shop efficiency, 
our parts sales volume was bound to go up in proportion. 76 cents for every dollar of labor sales. That's profitable business. Hmm, sounds interesting, George. I'll have to check my own figures when I get back. But after you found low efficiency in the shop, what did you do about it? Well, there are two things we worked on, Carl. First, we had to get enough customers into our place to keep up service sales. You know as well as I do that a shop needs plenty of volume if you want it to operate efficiently. Then we organized our service department for handling the work at peak efficiency to get the most gross out of the business we do and absorb the largest possible percent of our fixed expenses. I'll take you out in the shop in a few minutes to show you what we've done to handle our work more efficiently. But first, let me ask you, Carl, what are you doing about getting owners in? Well, we follow up our owners pretty regularly. We call them on the phone and make personal calls. And we've used a lot of those Nash service advertising folders. You know, that direct mail program. But frankly, George, I don't know what to think of this direct mail business. It's hard to see results. What do you think of it? Well, I've checked with men in the advertising business, and they've told me this. The automobile industry uses about $50 million worth of direct mail a year, about half of it directed to service customers. Direct mail is especially suited to dealers because it can be aimed at the car owners you want to influence without wasting money on people you don't care about reaching. Your own mailing list can be selected by make of car and by year model. Cars of about three to five years old are the best prospects because they are the cars that require service and their owners can afford to pay for it. Surveys show that direct mail is effective because enough people read it and act on it to make it pay off. It's the next best thing to a personal contact. If we keep getting our messages to the owner, it helps overcome the tendency to take his car to other places that may be nearer to him or where he thinks he gets better work or prices. Direct mail gives the owner reasons for coming to us. If you didn't get good results from your direct mail, Carl, you ought to check within your own operation for possible reasons for failure of the program. With direct mail, you've got to follow through. Check which owners come in as a result of the mailings. Then, too, you've got to be sure the owner receives the services he wants and that he's satisfied. Besides that, your mailing list must be accurate and up-to-date. Otherwise, some of the advertising is wasted. Oh, I'm sold on direct mail, all right. That's why I'm glad that Nash is providing a service mailing program for all its dealers. Listen to these features. Yes, it's true. Nash is providing a terrific program of direct mail advertising for promoting more service business. This advertising will keep reminding owners in your territory that your Nash dealership is the place to go for service. With timely mailings throughout the year, each piece features services tied in with the season when these jobs are needed most. Folded for mailing, it makes an attractive piece that invites attention to its message inside. Fully opened, its jumbo size provides many times the amount of space available on mailing cards ordinarily used for this purpose. A mailing list is provided, and the dealer can buy the advertising pieces in bulk to do his own mailing, or he can turn the job over to the supplier for complete handling. But in either case, the dealer decides which owners in his territory will get the mail. He controls the mailing. And making it easy for dealers to subscribe to this profit-building campaign, direct mail costs are chargeable to the parts account, costs that are much lower than on any previous program. This new service advertising gives the dealer complete coverage what he needs, when he needs it. And now is the time to go after that additional service gross. Now is the time, because with additional millions of cars crowding our highways, there's a constantly growing need for more service to take care of maintenance, repairs, and accidents. Every Nash dealer can tap the growing service market in his own territory by getting more customers in. Direct mail will help do this part of the job. Dealers can certainly use the extra gross from increased service and parts business to carry a bigger share of their fixed expenses. Remember, there's as much gross profit from a month's sales in each mechanic stall as there is in the sale of a new car. Increased customer traffic means 
more sales of labor and parts and accessories, more gross profit from service. Customer contact through direct mail will bring in the people you need for building up service volume, will help you get in touch with all those you want to reach. With a good program of service advertising and direct mail follow-up, every Nash dealer is then prepared to follow through on the job with a program of good customer relations and high efficiency that'll keep owners satisfied with the way they're taken care of. Owner follow-up by direct mail service advertising. High shop efficiency. Good customer relations. There's a combination that's sure to bring more absorption of fixed expenses through more profits from service. I've mentioned personal contact and told you how owner follow-up by direct mail service advertising helped us bring customers in. But to keep people coming back regularly, a dealer's got to have satisfied customers. And that's the part of our program I'm going to let my service manager tell you about. Well, don't forget, George, you said you'd take me through your shop while I'm here so I can see what improvements you've made that might help me in my dealership. Okay, Carl, let's go out there now. You know my service manager, Jim Blake, He's a good man for handling customers. Greets people promptly and courteously as they come in. Jim here listens to the whole story. Finds out what the customer wants. Shows a helpful interest in the owner's needs. And Carl, you know how important that is in the beginning of any service contact. As soon as he's finished with that customer over there, I'll have Jim take you around the shop. He'll explain our operation to you. A nice setup you have here, Jim. I uh, understand you've got some ideas I can use to increase the service volume in my own dealership. <laughs> well, maybe we have. It all started some time ago when the boss was talking to me about shop efficiency. He said, You know, Jim, a service department our size should be able to get out more work. Here are some figures on what other dealers are doing. What the boss said had me puzzled, because our boys were busy most of the time. But I learned later that all of our work didn't show up so well in the final analysis. Up until that time when a customer came in, I did my best at figuring out what was wrong with his car. But frankly, I wasn't always right. Sometimes I just couldn't tell what the car needed. So I had to write up repair orders like, check for a miss at high speed, check electrical system, check for low gas mileage. That checking business threw an extra burden on the mechanics. Sometimes it worked out all right, but sometimes it didn't. By the time a mechanic checked everything and replaced all the parts he wasn't sure of, the bill mounted up. And you know how a customer reacts when the bill's higher than he expects. New spark plugs? New distributor points? Well, I just had new ones put in. What kind of a place is this? It was bad enough for the customer to feel that we had taken him over even though we did our best to satisfy him. But if we hadn't fixed the trouble, he'd come back again. That's when he'd really let me have it. I could feel it coming. This is the third time I've been back, and I'm through paying to get this thing fixed. Besides the customer, the mechanic could kick like a steer, because he'd feel that the comeback wasn't his fault either. That left me strictly in the middle. But cases like that finally made me and the boss realize that failure to properly diagnose what a car needed was one of the reasons why our shop was inefficient, as the boss had said it was. The factory men had often told me about the results others were getting with the Nash program of diagnosis and prescribed service. So we decided to really try the system to see if it would answer our problem. We'd already invested in most of the testing equipment we needed, so it was simply a matter of putting that equipment to work in a diagnosis program. Another thing that made diagnosis easy to get started was this. We already had our shop fairly well set up by departments. You know, wheel alignment, lubrication, brakes, electrical, tune-up, body, and all that. And that's a necessary part of the system. Most mechanics like to specialize in certain kinds of work. They can make more money and turn out better jobs because they develop special skill and speed with experience. 
In each department, a mechanic specializing in that kind of work is the department operator. We decided to establish a diagnosis and prescribed service department as part of our departmentalized service. We held a meeting and pointed out the mistakes we'd been making. I explained how we consolidated the equipment we already had and how the diagnosis program ought to eliminate our troubles if we all work together. You should have seen the reaction when I told the boys how our new system ought to cut down complaints and comebacks and give them higher earnings. Naturally, they were glad to cooperate. Well, it makes sense, all right, Jim. I'd like to see how it actually works in the shop. Okay, just as soon as I wait on this customer. Maybe I can interest him in a diagnosis. Just stand by so you can see for yourself. My gas mileage has been going down. What do you suppose could be the matter? Well, it could be any number of things, Mr. Davis. You may need some work on the valves or your electrical system or the carburetor or perhaps just some minor adjustment. But before we can tell how to fix it, we have to find out exactly what the trouble is. I'll show you what I mean. This is our diagnosis setup. It takes the guesswork out of telling what's wrong with your car. We can give you better service at lower cost because we can prove you need anything we recommend. For example, this is our engine analyzer. It's a scientific testing unit that'll tell us exactly what's wrong with your engine, if anything, and what it'll need to restore it to standard performance. It'll save you money because there's no time wasted while a mechanic checks for the possible sources of trouble. It avoids the unnecessary replacement of parts, and it gets the job done right the first time. And then, too, diagnosis will point out anything else your car may need. You can often save money by taking care of little things before they develop into big repairs or let you down on a trip. After we've made a diagnosis, we'll give you a complete report. But you don't have to buy anything you don't want. If you'd like to wait, Mr. Davis, you can watch us while we diagnose your car. Most people find it interesting. Well, okay, I'll let you try it. Say, you know, this makes sense to me. They're really giving it a going over before they come to any conclusions. There you are, Mr. Davis. The trouble is in your distributor. The points aren't closing fast enough. Not enough spring tension, giving a weak spark. New set of points will take care of that. Another thing, your valves are burned and it would be a good idea to have them ground while the car's here. We do an engine tune-up with the valve job and that'd take care of everything. You see, Mr. Davis, if we didn't diagnose your car first, we'd have to guess at what the trouble was. This way, we're sure. And I can guarantee that the work I recommend will eliminate your trouble. I see what you mean, Jim. You can sell the job with confidence because diagnosis uncovers the exact cause of the trouble and you can prescribe the service needed. Exactly. That gets the job started right. Now let's go back into the shop. Here's our electrical department. Jack's our department operator. He likes electrical work and knows his stuff. He makes out better with diagnosed jobs because he knows what to do and he doesn't lose any time doing it. It'll be fixed right, ready on time and Everybody will be happy with the results. Well, when you don't get enough work to keep a department busy, what do you do then? Well, we may have to temporarily shift a man into another department that needs help. But we try to do something better than that. Take the body shop here, for instance. You see that job we're doing? We might not have gotten it if we hadn't been working a system. Here's how it goes. We keep close watch on the volume going through each department. If labor sales get too low, the mechanics can't be kept busy and the department can't operate with high efficiency. In the case of body work, about 25% of our labor sales should come from this department. When the percentage falls below that, we know that we're probably overlooking chances to do this kind of work. That means we need more sales effort on body jobs. Then, when we're diagnosing a car, we lay more stress on the sheet metal, paint and trim, so we can call the owner's attention to anything he needs. It's just good sense to concentrate on more of whatever work you need to keep each department busy and maintain high shop efficiency. Well, Carl, did you see anything interesting? It looks good, all right, George. What puzzles me is, if you can get results like this, why do you suppose more service departments don't make better use of diagnosis and prescribed service? Well, that's hard to say. I know in our case, we just didn't realize what it would do for us. We had talked a lot about it with the Nash Zone men, and we got some ideas out of those two films, Diagnosis and Prescribed Service, and As the Customer Sees It. So we decided to give the program a try. And that's what it needed, a real try. And the best part of the system is, 
It keeps everybody happy. The customers, the mechanics, my service manager, and myself. Say, you ought to hear how the customers feel about it. I like my Nash dealer service because they treat you right. They're courteous and helpful. They make a scientific diagnosis of what your car needs, and that's it. No running back and forth to get something fixed. What's more, the car's ready when they promise it, and the repair charges are what they quote you. No adding on a lot of parts because they're not sure which ones really need replacing. Believe me, when you want service on your car, that's the place to go. Of course, I don't have to tell you, Carl, that customers are the ones who pay our bills and wages through buying cars and having them serviced. And satisfied customers not only keep us all in business, but it's much easier to sell them a new or used car profitably. My mechanics are happy about the system because they can make some real money at it. Each one gets a chance to do more of the kind of work he likes best. Diagnosis cuts down on comebacks and the arguments about who's going to take the rap. That always puts the service manager on the spot. But Jim's happy now because his department is doing a real job for everybody, including myself. Naturally, with my mechanics making good money, the shop at high efficiency, and the customers satisfied, I profit too. And that's the best part of our service program. Everybody profits from service. film of a Nash sales engineering course, which we believe will be particularly helpful to our retail salesmen. This course is to give you, in easy to understand language, the important engineering principles on which an automobile is built. This information will make it possible for you to explain to your prospects why Nash cars are ahead of the industry in engineering design. It will help you show the superiority of Nash over competition. But most importantly, this sales engineering course can help you make more sales. This film deals with the carburetor, manifold, and combustion chamber. As car manufacturers introduce new features and improve designs, many of the improvements are described in engineering language that often is difficult to understand. When cars are described in such terms as brake horsepower, isothermal manifold, autothermic pistons, gyral drive and dynamic balance, it's liable to get a little confusing to car buyers. And it puts us salesmen on the spot too, trying to explain all this. Maybe you've been wondering about some of these things yourself, like these two Nash salesmen. What gets me is cars are getting harder to understand every day. Some of the things they're talking about just go right over my head. Take this engine business, for example. All you hear or read about now is High compression, piston displacement, high efficiency. What's it all mean? And how are you going to explain it to the prospect? You know as well as I do that what's mainly on the customer's mind is what does he get out of the deal? What's the car going to do for him? Yeah, I've done a lot of thinking about those technical terms myself. Take the specifications in the data book and catalogs. If we knew more about what's behind those specifications, we'd be able to do a better selling job. We could explain the facts better in terms of what the prospect wants. The Nash engineers work constantly to build extra values and exclusive features into the car. And it makes sense to me that if we knew more about the reasons back of these features, we could sell them better. For example, I'd like someone to give me the real lowdown on all this talk about engines. And what's cubic displacement, compression ratio, and all those things. You know, there's a story behind our engineering that would pack a terrific sales punch if we could just explain it. Right you are. In back of every Nash feature, there are basic engineering principles that must be understood before the feature itself can be fully appreciated and clearly presented to the customer. To help salesmen understand their products better, to enable them to answer objections and to offset the claims of competition, Nash is providing a series of explanations dealing with the basic engineering principles behind our car and its major features. 
If we can show a prospect what the feature will do and can back it up by explaining why, then we have a sales story that can overcome any objections or competitive claims. Of course, the prospect isn't interested in just buying an engineering feature like high compression ratio by itself. But he is very much interested in learning how any feature will add to his satisfaction as a car owner. So in preparing ourselves to talk engineering principles behind our features, we'll keep in mind that we're mainly interested in information that'll help us engineer a sale. To every prospect who's interested in what the Nash engine will do for him, we can show that Nash engineering provides the best balanced design. Our engine delivers economy and performance, plus durability and smooth operation. Our engine gives all of these advantages in good measure, without sacrificing one at the expense of another. Much of the superiority of the Nash engine is due to its high efficiency in getting the most out of the gas it uses. An understanding of why our engine is highly efficient will help us appreciate the benefits which the car owner gets in a Nash. Engine efficiency simply means getting the most power out of the engine from the gasoline that's put in. This engine efficiency, of course, plays a most important part in the car's economy and performance. Since all of the engine's power is derived from gasoline, let's start by checking what gasoline is and how it acts under conditions found in the engine. Let's see just how gasoline produces power. Gasoline gives off a tremendous amount of heat as it burns. This heat is a form of energy. If properly applied, the heat can be made to produce mechanical power. The heat from burning gasoline expands the air and gases involved in the burning. This expansion creates pressure. In an engine, this pressure is the source of all power. Generally speaking, one brand of gasoline has about the same potential amount of energy in it as the next brand. It's the engine's job to get the greatest possible amount of energy from the gasoline for driving the car. How well the engine turns the gasoline into heat and heat into useful power is the measure of the engine's efficiency. And that's the beginning of any story about economy and performance. Gasoline can be set on fire only when it is mixed with a certain amount of oxygen or air to support combustion. If gasoline is burned in an open container, the gasoline and air can't mix very well. Not enough air comes in contact with the gasoline for good combustion, so the flame is smoky. That black smoke is carbon, a part of the gasoline that isn't burning. This flame is not efficient, it wastes fuel. Unless the gasoline burns completely, it can't give up all of its heat energy. Gasoline and air can be mixed better for more efficient combustion. If the gasoline is sprayed out of a nozzle, as is done in a spray gun or atomizer. If a gasoline spray nozzle is placed inside a tube carrying air, and we add valves for controlling the flow of gasoline and air, we can regulate the mixture. When the gasoline and air are mixed in the right proportions, the flame is hot and free of smoke. The gasoline is completely burned and gives up all of its heat energy. We say that this flame is efficient. It does not waste fuel. If two flames burn the same amount of gasoline, the flame with a better mixture will be more efficient. It gets more heat from the same amount of fuel. The size of the flame has nothing to do with its efficiency. A large flame will generate a lot of heat because it's burning a lot of gasoline. But it can still be inefficient and waste much of the fuel. We might say that this flame has the power for performance, but it doesn't have much economy. It's not getting all the heat out of the gas that it should. A small, efficient flame burning less gasoline can give off as much heat as a larger, inefficient flame. We can say that the smaller flame has the same power as the larger one, but it also has more economy. It saves fuel by getting more heat out of the gas it burns. Obviously, the proper mixture of gasoline and air has a great deal to do with the amount of heat generated. Since an engine operates entirely on the heat of burning gasoline, it can be seen how vital the right mixture is for engine efficiency in developing power for economy and performance. In an 
one engine, the carburetor does the mixing of the gasoline and air. We have just seen how important this mixing is. Now, let's see how it's done. The carburetor sprays gasoline through a nozzle into the airstream as the air and gas are drawn into the engine by the pumping of the pistons. The gasoline is broken up into tiny drops or a fine mist. This fine mist of gasoline quickly evaporates or changes into a vapor that mixes with the air. The gasoline behaves like water that evaporates into the air on a hot day, making the air damp or humid. As the gasoline vapor and air leave the carburetor, the mixture should be in the right proportion and condition to burn properly. This is necessary to get all possible heat out of the gasoline. The gasoline air mixture next travels through the intake manifold. This manifold is the breathing tube through which the engine inhales. Its job is to deliver the mixture to the cylinders in the best possible condition for burning. If the temperature of the intake manifold is too low, the gasoline will condense inside the manifold and drip out of the mixture, just as water condenses from the air when humid air strikes a cold surface. And since gasoline too condenses at low temperature, the mixture of gas and air changes. This leaves the mixture with too little gas in it for proper combustion. If the temperature of the intake manifold is too high, the gasoline air mixture becomes overheated, and that's bad too, as we'll see in a minute. If the intake manifold is maintained at the proper temperature throughout its length, the gasoline and air can reach the passage to the intake valve without harmful disturbance to the mixture. Many things happen to the gasoline and air inside the cylinder, which have an important bearing on our story. We'll follow the action through four strokes of the piston in an engine of only one cylinder. On the intake stroke, the piston draws in the gasoline-air mixture through the open intake valve. The valve, of course, is part of the breathing system through which the engine inhales. After the intake stroke, the intake valve closes and the piston moves upward to compress gasoline and air. The mixture is squeezed or compressed into a smaller space. As the gasoline-air mixture is compressed, it becomes heated. Whenever air is compressed into a smaller space, the air gets hot, and the more it's compressed, the more heat is generated. The heating that takes place during compression is very important, because if a gasoline-air mixture is compressed too much, it can get hot enough to burn or explode. As the piston reaches the top of the compression stroke, the mixture has been squeezed into a small fraction of the space it occupied at the beginning of the stroke. The amount of space above the piston at the beginning of the compression stroke, compared with the space left at the end of the stroke, determines the engine's compression ratio. For example, if the space above the piston at the bottom of its stroke is 35 cubic inches, and the space left at the top of the stroke is 5 cubic inches, then the compression ratio is 35 to 5, or 7 to 1. Compression ratio is important to engine efficiency because the more the mixture is compressed up to a certain point, the more power can be obtained from the same amount of gasoline. The effect of compression can be shown by an example. If we set fire to a small amount of gunpowder inside a large container, the flame generates heat, but there's little pressure built up. As far as power is concerned, the heat is mainly wasted. If we place the same amount of gunpowder in a cartridge and fire it, the bullet is driven with terrific force by the pressure packed in a small space. A high compression ratio means packing or squeezing the gasoline and air into the combustion chamber under high pressure, making it possible to get more power out of the fuel. But remember, too much compression may produce too much heat, and this may cause an uncontrolled explosion of the gasoline. Let's see what happens. When the compressed mixture is set on fire by a spark from the spark plug, the flame begins to spread with great speed across the combustion chamber. As the mixture burns, it generates a great deal of heat and pressure. This pressure travels ahead of the flame and compresses the unburned part of the mixture on the opposite side of the combustion chamber. 
If the unburned part of the mixture is compressed too much, it suddenly explodes from the heat of being compressed. This explosion creates still more heat and pressure and results in a ping or knock in the engine. When an engine knocks, it means that the piston and combustion chamber are being hammered by these uncontrolled explosions. This hammering wastes gasoline, overheats the engine, and overstrains the parts. If the gasoline air mixture is first overheated in the intake manifold, then when the mixture is further heated by high compression, knocking results. The hotter the mixture is to start with, the sooner it will knock during combustion. If the gasoline air mixture enters the cylinder at the right temperature, as provided by Nash sealed in manifolding, it can be compressed more without causing a knock. And higher compression means more efficient burning of the gasoline. To reduce or eliminate knocking, and to allow the use of higher compression ratios, gasoline is usually treated to give it a higher anti-knock value, or as it is commonly called, a higher octane rating. A gasoline with a higher octane rating means that it can stand more compression before it'll knock. Its anti-knock value is increased ordinarily by the addition of an anti-knock compound. Generally speaking, there is the same potential amount of energy in a gallon of regular gasoline as there is in a gallon of premium anti-knock gas. But some engines, due to their less efficient design, have to use the premium grade to prevent knocking and loss of power. The thing to remember is this. When the temperature of the mixture has been properly controlled, good combustion results even with regular gasoline. This produces a steadier pressure on the piston without knocking. And this pressure can be more efficiently turned into useful power. On the final or exhaust stroke, the piston pushes the burned gases out of the cylinder. It's important that the valves and the rest of the exhaust system provide an unobstructed path for easy outward flow of these gases. Of course, there's much more going on inside the engine that affects power and economy, which will be covered in later films. But right now, let's consider how the basic principles we've just seen are applied by Nash engineers. We all know from our own experience and from the experience of owners, that Nash cars are outstanding in their performance and economy. The reason for this is the way in which Nash engineers have applied the basic engineering principles we have just reviewed. To see how the basic engineering principles are applied by Nash, let's start again with the carburetor. The Uniflow jet design is an exclusive development by Nash engineers. It got its name from the fact that it combines two main gasoline jets or nozzles into one. Now, as we've already seen, a nozzle in the carburetor sprays gasoline into the airstream. This provides the mixture for steady speed driving. For fast acceleration, however, an extra shot of gas is needed. An accelerator pump is therefore linked to the accelerator pedal. This pump supplies extra gas each time the pedal is stepped on. In an ordinary carburetor, the accelerating gas is fed through an extra nozzle. This accelerating nozzle can't be placed in the best location because the main nozzle is already there. Since the main nozzle occupies the one best position, gasoline entering through the accelerating nozzle is not as well mixed with the air, and some of the gasoline doesn't mix at all. This means poor performance and poor economy. With only one nozzle in our Uniflow jet design, all gasoline enters the airstream at the proper place to give the best mixture of gasoline and air. This is one of the outstanding reasons for the economy and performance of Nash. Another outstanding feature on all Nash engines is the sealed-in intake manifold. It is called the isothermal manifold, which simply means even temperature. Now that we realize how important it is to control the temperature of the gasoline-air mixture, we can appreciate the great value of this superior feature, a feature that is exclusive with Nash. Our sealed-in manifold is kept at an even temperature because almost its entire area is surrounded by water. There are no hot spots, no cool spots. 
The sealed-in manifold delivers the gasoline air mixture to the cylinder at an even, controlled temperature. This makes it possible to have the high compression ratio found in Nash cars without engine knocking. It also makes possible greater economy, performance, and smoothness. Positive proof of the superiority of Nash design is shown by the fact that while our engines use a high compression ratio, they do not have to use premium extra cost gasoline, except under unusual or extreme conditions. Remember there's no additional power to be obtained from premium gasoline unless an engine knocks on regular gas. Nash owners can save the difference on every gallon. This alone can easily save Nash owners many dollars a year and without any sacrifice in power or performance. All other manufacturers use a type of intake manifold like this one, fastened to the outside of the engine. Temperature control depends on a thermostatically operated valve that regulates the flow of exhaust gases around a hot spot on the intake manifold. This type of hot spot control can overheat the gasoline air mixture. We've already seen that a mixture that's too hot will cause knocking and loss of power. This difficulty forces the other manufacturers to use a lower compression ratio or to require the use of extra cost premium gasoline. Besides, and this is one of its greatest weaknesses, there's no way of lubricating the thermostatic valve, so it usually corrodes from the high temperatures and becomes stuck. That puts the temperature of the gasoline air mixture entirely out of control. If the thermostatic valve is loosened to prevent sticking, another trouble develops. The valve rattles. The difficulties which owners are experiencing with this type of construction are shown in a recent service analysis by a nationally known impartial organization. An examination of 300 service reports showed that manifold heat control difficulties were one of the three most frequent failures in service. Not one Nash owner could ever experience this trouble because Nash, with sealed-in manifold, does not need to use a manifold thermostatic valve. Ordinary intake manifolds are not only heated too much in some spots, they're cooled too much in others. Excessive cooling causes gasoline to condense inside the manifold. Then the mixture contains too much air. This is what is meant by too lean a mixture. In an ordinary manifold, the front is blasted by the fan, the center is heated by the exhaust, and the rear is at some temperature in between. Because of this uneven heating of the gasoline and air, it is impossible to set the carburetor for the best mixture. The mixture must be a compromise because it's subjected to uneven manifold heating. Either performance or economy or both suffer as a result. But the Nash sealed in manifold is protected from cooling blasts of air and maintains an even heat. It doesn't need a hot spot even for fast warm up since it is quickly and evenly heated by the water around it. And finally, let's not forget that our sealed-in manifold eliminates the heavy cast iron manifold used in ordinary engine designs. So we get rid of all the nuts, bolts, washers, gaskets, and clamps needed to fasten a manifold to the engine. These parts considerably increase the cost of servicing. With so many solid engineering facts in our favor, we, as Nash salesmen, have a big advantage over competition in discussing engine values with any prospect. The greater advantages from Nash engines are based upon the engine's high efficiency. Our Uniflow jet carburetor, sealed-in manifold, and high compression ratio are an unmatched combination that gets the most out of every drop of gasoline. Nash has the best balanced engine design. We offer economy with performance, and performance with economy. Neither is sacrificed at the expense of the other. Both these benefits are the natural result of correct engineering by Nash. Our engineers have pioneered in modern engine design. Nash leads the industry in giving owners the advanced engineering that means unsurpassed economy and performance. That's why we can call Nash the world's most modern car. Of course, the proof of good engineering lies in what the car will do in the hands of the customer. 
and the proof of good selling lies in getting the facts across. We know that Nash pioneered many modern engine developments. We know that the Nash engine is economical, powerful, smooth, and durable. Now, let's put good engineering and good selling together. You now have the facts to convince your prospects that Nash has the finest engine. The engine which, because of its balanced design, has proven its efficiency, economy, performance, smoothness, and durability in millions of miles of everyday driving. Build these facts into your sales talk so your prospects will realize that Nash gives them what they want, the finest balanced engine, engineered for top efficiency. This is the second film of the Nash Sales Engineering course. We hope that the first film, dealing with the carburetor, manifold, and combustion chamber, has helped you convince your prospects of the superiority of engineering features built into our product. This film deals with torque and horsepower, and also explains why Nash six-cylinder engines are smooth, powerful, dependable, and economical. Let's listen to this very interesting subject of torque and horsepower. We know it will make your product presentation still more effective if you use it in your selling work. When it comes to evaluating engines, a prospect is frequently confused by what he has read in advertisements or has been told by different salesmen. A question that often puzzles a prospect is this. What is the best number of cylinders for an automobile engine? Four? Six? Eight or what? Before answering that, let's consider what people really want when they buy a car. People will buy the car that they feel best suits their needs. The car that will satisfy them the most as car owners. Of course, the engine, as the power plant of the car, is a very important factor in the selection of an automobile. Car owners want an engine that gives them certain benefits. Performance, economy, durability, and smoothness. So let's keep these qualities in mind whenever we discuss engines with prospects. Almost any discussion of the units of an engine in terms of what a customer wants requires the use of the words torque and power. Most people have some idea of what power is, but with torque, it's different. Torque and horsepower are so important that it will pay any salesman to take the time to really understand them. This knowledge will give a Nash salesman a better appreciation of his own product and will help him outsell competition when it comes to discussing engine efficiency and performance. So in taking up the question of how many cylinders an engine needs to deliver the best results to the car owner, we'll start by checking into torque and power because they have a whole lot to do with the answer. First, let's examine torque. We're all familiar with the fact that it takes a certain amount of force or effort to move any object. And the harder the object is to move, the more force is required. Here we have examples of a direct push or pull being used to move objects. This push or pull is force, acting in a straight line. But an engine cannot move an automobile by a straight line force such as a push or a pull. To move an automobile, we must have a turning or rotating force. We all know that when a cylinder is fired, the piston is driven down in the cylinder. Here again, we have a straight line force, a thrust or a push. But to make this straight line push of the piston drive the car, we must change it to a twisting or turning force. To do this, the connecting rods are so designed and fastened to the crankshaft that when the connecting rod is driven down by the piston, a turning or twisting motion or force results. To this turning or twisting force, engineers have given the name torque. 
Let us repeat that. Torque is the name given to any twisting or rotating force. It is torque, or this twisting force produced by the engine, which drives an automobile. It is transmitted to the crankshaft and transmission, then to the drive shaft, and by the differential is transmitted to the wheels. The torque produced determines how much load the engine is capable of moving and how fast it can start and move away with that load. The maximum torque produced is the true measure of an engine's performance efficiency. However, in actual operation, the torque produced by an engine is changing constantly, for torque, as we shall explain, is affected by many factors, such as speed and the weight of the load that must be moved. Let us look at some illustrations to learn more about how torque operates. We're familiar with the fact that if we apply a force to the handle of a wrench, for instance, we can turn the wrench against a resistance, such as to tighten a bolt. This turning force, or effort, is a simple example of torque. We apply torque whenever we wind a watch, or turn a crank, or pull on the steering wheel. An important point to remember about torque is that the harder it is to turn anything, the more torque we have to apply. It takes only a small effort, or torque, to overcome a small resistance and a large torque to overcome a large resistance. For example, it's easy to spin a wrench when the bolt turns freely, but it takes a lot of torque or twisting effort to tighten the bolt. It takes a lot of force on the wrench. An important thing to notice is this. The turning of the bolt doesn't depend on the torque alone, but on the amount of torque compared to the amount of resistance that's offered. A high torque or force on the wrench might not turn the bolt at all if the bolt is frozen or rusted. In an automobile, torque from the engine is what makes the wheels go round and drive the car. And the same principles apply as with a wrench. As the car meets resistance to its motion, the torque supplied by the motor must be increased to keep the wheels turning. For example, a car without excess weight does not need as much torque in starting off as a car with greater weight. The car without excess weight offers less resistance to getting it going. This is one of the advantages that results from Nash Air Flight construction with its elimination of useless weight. Now, let's see how torque is measured. Torque is measured in pound feet. If a hundred pound weight is supported by the handle of a wrench, for instance, at a distance of one foot from the center of a bolt, a torque of 100 pound-feet is produced. The more weight or force that's applied to produce turning, the more pound-feet of torque. And the same thing is true of engine torque. When an engine is developing 200 pound-feet of torque, it means that its crankshaft has the same twisting force as though 200 pounds were pulling on the crankshaft at one foot from its center. The more torque, the more the engine can keep turning against resistance. But when the load or resistance becomes too great, the engine stalls. Now, let's look at a different kind of a machine that also develops torque. Here is an ordinary hand-operated hoist for lifting. If a push or force is applied to the handle, a torque is produced on the shaft that will tend to wind up the rope. When there is little weight being lifted, it takes only a light torque to turn the handle. But a heavy weight will require a heavy torque. Now, let's see how power comes into the picture, how torque and power fit together. If a man cranks slowly, he'll lift the weight a certain distance every second. If he cranks twice as fast, he'll lift the weight twice as far in the same time. In both cases, he is applying the same torque and lifting the same weight, but he is working at two different rates or speeds. At the faster rate, he must use more power. The same is true in engines. Power depends on both torque and the speed of turning. Under different conditions, the horsepower output depends upon the torque necessary to move the load and the speed at which the engine is turning. Before engines were developed, horses were used as a main source of power. It was learned by experiment that an average horse could lift 550 pounds one foot a second. This amount of power was therefore called a horsepower. 
A horsepower can be applied in different ways. For example, a fast horse pulling a light load covers more distance per second than a strong horse pulling a heavy load. They may each develop one horsepower, but they differ in how hard they pull and how fast they go. And the same thing is true of power for driving an automobile. To understand this more clearly, let's use manpower instead of horsepower to drive a car. The man's arm would be like a connecting rod, and the crank he turned would be like a crankshaft. As this car comes to an upgrade, the man has to put a heavier push or torque on the crank to maintain the same speed as on a level road. The man now produces more power because he is pushing harder on the crank, but he still moves at the same speed. He must produce more power because it takes greater torque to overcome the resistance. In a car, we're all familiar with the fact that if we want to maintain our speed as we come to a hill, we have to step harder on the gas. This increases the engine's torque to overcome the added resistance of the hill. The engine now develops more power even though it doesn't run any faster. On a level road, a car doesn't need so much torque to maintain a fairly high speed. The engine doesn't have to pull very hard, but its power output will be high because the engine is running fast. The engine in a car pulling slowly up a hill may be developing the same horsepower as an engine driving a car fast on a level road. One is producing a heavy torque at low speed, the other a light torque at high speed. Now let's see how torque and power are produced inside the engine and what the number of cylinders has to do with the way the engine performs. As we have already shown, in an engine, the heat and pressure of combustion push downward on the piston. This force on the piston is transmitted by the connecting rod to the crankshaft and produces the engine's torque. It's possible to develop plenty of torque even in a one-cylinder engine if the cylinder is made large enough to produce a big push on the crankshaft like a giant turning a crank. Here's how it works out. A large cylinder makes possible a large piston displacement. That is, on the intake stroke, the piston can draw in a large volume of gas and air. This provides a lot of fuel for a big combustion. Let's say the cylinder can draw in 240 cubic inches of gas-air mixture. Upon combustion, a large pressure is generated by the large amount of burning gas. This pressure acts on the top of the piston. The larger the piston, the more force produced from the pressure and the more torque exerted on the crankshaft. A one-cylinder engine has several advantages. It's cheap to build, which means a lower car price. And it has few parts, so that it's economical for the owner to have serviced. Its low cost makes a big appeal. And that leads to a very natural question. Yeah, but if a one-cylinder engine is so economical and can be made big enough to develop lots of torque, why isn't it used in automobiles? A good question. And here's the answer. A one-cylinder engine has only one power stroke for every four piston strokes, or every two revolutions of the crankshaft. This results in uneven torque and a rough-running engine. The bigger the cylinder is made to increase the torque, the worse this roughness becomes. And here's another thing. We've already seen that an engine's power increases as the engine is speeded up. When a one-cylinder engine is run at high speed to step up its power output, it vibrates badly, and engineers admit that there isn't much that can be done about it. To get a smoother running engine, and one that can be operated at higher speeds, more cylinders are needed. One big cylinder can be divided into six smaller cylinders while keeping the piston displacement the same. In other words, the six smaller cylinders can take in as much gas-air mixture as the one big cylinder. In the six-cylinder engine, the crankshaft gets a smaller push from each of the smaller pistons, but the power strokes come more often, three times during each engine revolution. This keeps the crankshaft turning with an even torque to produce smooth running, and the engine can be operated at high speeds for high power. Which leads to another question. Yeah, here's what I want to know. 
Why six cylinders? Why not four or eight or some other number? That's exactly what we're going to show now. Six cylinders are used because six cylinders can provide the greatest amount of advantages that people want. If we have fewer cylinders or more cylinders, some of these advantages are lost. For example, with only four cylinders, engineers agree that it's impossible to balance the engine to eliminate vibration. If the cylinders are made large and the engine is run fast to step up the power, the vibration problem becomes worse. Four-cylinder engines are often used in racing cars, but in those cases, smoothness and quiet operation don't count as much as power, reliability, and ease of servicing. Four-cylinder engines can be built and operated at low cost, but in spite of this advantage, most buyers do not want the four-cylinder type. People feel that the gain in low cost is not worth the loss of smoothness. Now, if we use eight cylinders, we get into a different problem. Eight cylinders add too many parts that are not necessary to achieve smoothness. The higher cost of these additional parts must be charged to the buyer, and the complicated engine becomes less dependable in operation and more expensive to service. Some eights are built like two four-cylinder engines with two pairs of manifolds, extra pistons, rings, valves, spark plugs, and many other parts. These items raise the cost of the new car or force a reduction in quality in other parts of the car. The added parts also increase the owner's service expenses. Many engines of this type are difficult to get at for maintenance repairs. We can now sum up the situation like this. With four cylinders or less, an engine lacks smoothness. With eight cylinders or more, an engine sacrifices economy in new car cost and in operating expense. And here's another important thing. Torque and power do not depend on the number of cylinders alone. The size of the pistons, their displacement, the efficiency with which the gasoline is burned and converted into heat energy, all have an influence on the engine's performance. Six cylinders are best because they can be made to develop plenty of torque and power with great smoothness, and at the same time give outstanding economy and durability. The six has neither too many nor too few cylinders. As a matter of fact, engineers have called the six-cylinder engine the ideal power plant for automobiles. To the natural advantages of this design, Nash has added numerous refinements and exclusive features. As a result of many years of engineering development, the Nash line of six-cylinder engines today gives the greatest values available to car buyers. Nash has the best balanced design. Since owners want the most of performance, economy, smoothness, and durability, it's obvious that the best engine is the one that delivers the most of these advantages. Let's check our Nash engines on each of these benefits. We've already seen that all engine power comes from the heat of burning gasoline, and that the more completely the gas is burned, the more heat and pressure are developed and the more torque and power result. We also know that good combustion depends on a good mixture of gasoline and air, and that our Uniflow jet carburetor does this job of mixing better than any other design. We know, too, that it's important to carry the gas-air mixture into the cylinders at the right temperature, not too hot, not too cool. And our sealed-in manifold does this job better than any other design. We realize that Nash engines burn gasoline more efficiently because their compression ratio is high, but not so high as to cause knocking and waste of power. The combination of Uniflow jet carburetor, sealed-in manifold, and high compression makes it possible for Nash engines to use regular gasoline and to burn the fuel with high efficiency. This results in many advantages. The superior combustion efficiency of Nash produces a more effective pressure on the piston. This means more torque, more turning effort on the crankshaft, and more power from the gasoline. Nash superior efficiency means that more cylinders or bigger cylinders are not necessary. Our six cylinders produce all the power that is needed, 
all the power that most owners want. Six efficient cylinders do an outstanding job. So why add more? Nash efficient combustion with its steadier pressure on the piston and freedom from knocking means smoother power. Nash does not have to add more cylinders to eliminate roughness because our engines are already smooth from their basic design. And finally, Nash combustion efficiency means more economy because the extra torque and power from more efficient burning of the fuel drives the car farther on the same amount of gasoline. The proof of an engine's efficiency is more miles to each gallon of gas consumed. It turns gas into greater productive horsepower and torque. And Nash engines are foremost in their gas economy in the automotive market today. Besides their great fuel efficiency, Nash engines offer still further economy because their six cylinders require a minimum of working parts. This contributes also to their great durability and dependability. Compared to an eight, Nash engines are less complicated. Nash engines, with their smaller number of parts, are less expensive to operate and less costly to service than an eight-cylinder engine. When these lower costs are added to Nash gasoline savings, it means real economy to the owner. Many of the competitive engines, about which so much has been advertised, employ eight cylinders. These have the general disadvantages of the complicated eight-cylinder design, which we have already mentioned, plus some additional drawbacks. Some competitive engines require the use of high-octane, extra-cost gasoline. This naturally increases the cost of operation to the owner when compared with Nash engines that give top performance on regular gasoline. Besides, if an owner is unable to obtain the high octane gas needed by some competitive engines and is forced to use regular gasoline, the engine will knock and lose power. This results in a loss of performance, economy, and smoothness. There has also been much publicity about other engines that are being developed in competitive engineering laboratories. These engines are not yet ready for the public, but here's an important point about the claims being made. The extremely high octane gas needed to run some of the newly publicized engines is not available to car owners now. Besides, experts feel that the petroleum industry cannot supply this high octane gasoline in large quantities for a long time to come. As a matter of fact, it appears that gasoline of lower octane rating may have to be served to car owners. Nash has faced these facts and is producing engines that will give top performance to the car owner now on gasoline that he can actually buy and at a price that makes economical operation a reality. When the advantages of Nash six-cylinder engines are combined with the additional advantages of air flight construction, the benefits to the owner become even larger. For example, we know that air flight construction eliminates useless weight. This lowered weight reduces the amount of torque and horsepower needed to keep a Nash rolling over the road. And this means lower fuel consumption. Furthermore, less weight means easier, faster hill climbing. Less weight means faster pickup. The combination of Nash engine efficiency and weight-saving air flight construction results in better performance as well as gasoline economy. You're all familiar with the records set by Nash in the past that prove our superiority. Now let's look at some new records that offer new proof of leadership over competition. For example, in a grand national circuit race at Charlotte, North Carolina, a 1951 Nash ambassador beat 40 other stock cars of the latest models. For 150 miles, at an average speed of over 70 miles an hour, Nash demonstrated its superiority in performance over competitive cars, many of them with eight-cylinder engines. In the 1951 Mobile Gas Economy run, a Nash Rambler set a new all-time economy record with better than 31 miles to the gallon. In June 1951 at Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Herschel Buchanan, driving a Nash Ambassador, won first place and set a new International Motors Contest Association stock car record. He drove 
79 miles around a half-mile track in 90 minutes. The previous record, set by an eight-cylinder car, was 70 and one-half miles in 90 minutes. In the Nash Ambassador, Statesman, and Rambler, owners have found the cars with the gasoline economy that they want, plus marvelous records of performance and durability. Yes, in test after test over the years, and in the hands of hundreds of thousands of owners, Nash engines have proven their all-around value and the advantages of their superior six-cylinder design. Nash engines, with their properly balanced design, give everything the owner wants in the way of performance, economy, smoothness, and durability. All of these advantages in full measure. Nash pioneered in designing high-compression engines as far back as 1917, and since then has continued to lead the field in their development. Nash six-cylinder engines today are the result of engineering leadership in the industry over the years. Our engines are thoroughly proven products. Nash engines have always been smooth. Our better controlled combustion and our well-balanced, well-supported crankshaft keep vibration down. There has been no need to add more cylinders for smooth running. Nash engineering has developed the six-cylinder design to a new high in perfection providing modern engines of advanced design for the world's most modern cars. Yes, people want the benefits that Nash engines can give them. When we tell our prospects about these advantages, they'll want the car, the only car, with six-cylinder engines by Nash. in the Nash sales engineering course, we have covered principles basic to the understanding of carburation, manifolding, and high compression, and the contribution which they make to produce maximum horsepower and torque. In this third film, you will see that there are many other features of equal importance, such as crankshaft counterbalancing, oil flow control, and engine cooling. They are necessary to produce an all-around efficiently operating engine. With all the claims and counterclaims made today by car manufacturers about the individual merits of L-head engines versus valve and head engines, undoubtedly many prospects are confused. Well, here's a prospect who feels exactly like that. This prospect has been looking around at different makes of new cars. Right now, he's on his way into a Nash dealership and is thinking about something that many people often wonder about. I notice that Nash makes two different types of engines, an L-head and a valve and head. I wonder why. I wonder which of the two designs is considered better. I'm interested in seeing what a Nash salesman will have to say about it. Of course, if this prospect asked you why Nash makes an L-head and a valve and head engine, you'd probably be ready with the answer. But there's so much being advertised and claimed today in regard to engines it might be a good time to review the reasons for Nash L-head and valve and head designs, and to look into some of the other fine points of our engines, too. An understanding of our engineering principles will help us all to appreciate our own products better, to present them to prospects convincingly, and to offset the claims of competition. So let's continue our study of useful selling facts about Nash engines. Nash makes an L-head and a valve and head engine because both are excellent designs and each has certain advantages. Each design provides a different combination of benefits that different customers want. Yes, Nash offers the L-head and valve and head design because many people do have a preference for one type or the other. By giving buyers their choice, our market becomes wider. We can satisfy those who want either type of engine. And that is a sales advantage. As is well known in the auto industry, it costs less to build an L-head than a valve and head engine. This saving in manufacturing cost is passed on to the customer, 
through a lower price on the new car. By producing L-head engines that are somewhat smaller and less costly to build than the Ambassador Jetfire engine, Nash is able to compete in various price ranges, and that greatly increases our total market. So we'll check into the features and advantages of both types of Nash engines, starting with the L-head design as used in the Statesman and Rambler. Our Statesman and Rambler engines have an exclusive design of intake and exhaust manifolds that gives them a big advantage over ordinary L-head engines. Manifolds, as well as valves, are important because they are both part of the engine's breathing system. Breathing is just as vital to an engine as it is to a human being. Any feature that improves an engine's inhaling of the intake mixture and exhaling of the exhaust will also improve the engine's economy and performance. The Statesman and Rambler use a very efficient intake manifold with four ports or passages for leading the gas-air mixture into the cylinders. These ports provide large paths of flow for the mixture and give our engines a good intake. They make it easy to breathe in. Most competitive six-cylinder engines use intake manifolds with only three ports. This arrangement is less efficient than the Nash four-port design. With only three passages to the cylinders, the engine cannot draw in or inhale the gas-air mixture as efficiently as Nash engines. The Ambassador engine, because it has a greater piston displacement and draws in a greater volume of gas-air mixture, needs a bigger passageway for efficient intake breathing. So six ports are provided. Yes, six ports, one for each cylinder. The overhead valves on the Ambassador are another means of helping this powerful engine inhale its gas-air mixture more easily and efficiently. Let's see why. Here is a simple valve and head engine, as seen from one end, so we can look at its intake system. Notice that there is a fairly straight path for the gas-air mixture to follow when going from the manifold into the cylinder. This straight path is one of the advantages of the valve and head engine. When the piston goes down on the intake stroke, the gas and air are drawn easily and rapidly into the cylinder because of the direct path provided by the overhead valve. This faster flow means more mixture gets into the cylinder while the intake valve is open. It means better engine inhaling. On the exhaust stroke, the overhead valve provides a fast-flowing direct passage for the exhaust gases. This enables the piston to push out the burned gases more quickly and to completely clean out the cylinder for the intake stroke that follows. Another advantage of the overhead design is the easy accessibility of the valves for adjustment. And that brings up an important point about the overhead valves on our ambassador. Nash engineers have been building valve and head engines for 35 years. As a result of this long experience, our engineers have learned how to achieve quiet valve action and to provide valves that stay in adjustment. This is a great selling advantage because many manufacturers who feature valve and head engines in their line have been unable to overcome the problem of noisy valves, and naturally owners object to this. And here's another thing. The Ambassador engine does not need hydraulic valve lifters as used by some manufacturers to quiet their valve action. Nash achieves quiet operation through a proper design that does not require any extra devices. Now let's sum up the advantages that customers get with either an L-head or a valve and head engine in a Nash. The L-head engine makes possible a car with a lower price and therefore widens our sales market. And then there are some people who prefer the L-head arrangement, and it's just good business to provide what people want. The Nash L-head design has a breathing system superior to any other L-head engine, and this contributes to the outstanding economy and performance of the Statesman and Rambler. For those who want additional power and performance, for those who want exceptional gasoline economy even when driving at high speed, for those who are willing to pay more to get a car that ranks with the world's finest, then the Ambassador, with its highly efficient valve and head design, is the car for them. While the Ambassador differs in its valve arrangement from the Statesman and the Rambler, both types use many of the same exclusive features that make our engine superior to any others. For example, all Nash engines, Ambassador, Statesman, and Rambler, 
have the benefit of the sealed-in feature of our intake manifold. This not only results in a better flow while breathing in the gas and air, but keeps the mixture at an even temperature, which is equally important. All Nash engines have the exclusive Uniflow jet carburetor to mix the gasoline and air for best performance and economy. All Nash engines use a simple design of exhaust manifold that aids in the easy flow of exhaust gases. The manifold is clamped directly to the engine and no gaskets are required. Notice the neat, clean appearance and compare this with competitive designs. Ordinary exhaust manifolds are generally made of thick cast iron and require frequent service due to cracking, warping and leaks of the gaskets. The Nash design is more durable and more economical in service. Now let's get on with some other features that will help you convince prospects of the superiority of Nash engines. The crankshaft, for instance. The importance of a heavy, rigidly supported crankshaft can be better appreciated when it is realized that the combustion force on the piston runs as high as three tons. This force is transmitted by the connecting rod to the crankshaft and produces the engine's torque. If the crankshaft is not rigid enough to withstand the great forces placed upon it, the shaft will whip and bend, causing engine vibration. And here's another important thing. The crankshaft must not only be strong and rigid, but also properly balanced. Otherwise, it'll shake the whole engine as it whirls around, like a wheel that shakes and shimmies from being out of balance. A crankshaft, like a wheel, requires an even distribution of weight all around and this is achieved by the use of counterweights. In the Ambassador engine, the crankshaft is 100% counterbalanced by the use of eight counterweights. This assures smooth operation as the crankshaft whirls around, even at high speeds. To obtain the smoothness that results from strength and rigidity, the Ambassador crankshaft is a very heavy construction and is supported by seven main bearings, the only American passenger car that uses seven bearings. In the Statesman and Rambler engines, a heavy crankshaft is also used and is balanced by seven counterweights. This crankshaft does not have to be as large as the Ambassador's, nor does it need as many main bearings because the engines that use this crankshaft develop less torque. Both crankshafts are designed for best results in their particular engines. Their rigid strength and fine balance add greatly to the smoothness durability and dependability that owners get in any Nash engine. Even greater smoothness is assured in all Nash engines by the use of rubber engine mountings. These further reduce vibrations and prevent them from being transmitted to the passenger compartment. All Nash engines also benefit from the controlled efficient combustion that produces steadier pressures on the pistons. This makes an important contribution to smoothness and prevents knocking that would result in rough engine operation. Another feature found on all Nash engines is the U-Flex oil control piston ring. It is made of very flexible steel and its action adds to our economy and durability. Here's how it works. The U-Flex oil ring has evenly spaced slots all around its outside edge. When installed in the engine, the ring becomes compressed and these slots narrow down to about a thousandth of an inch. When the U-Flex ring is operating inside the cylinder, these compressed slots allow just the right amount of oil on the cylinder walls for proper lubrication. This positive control of oil flow overcomes the difficulties that occur with ordinary designs. Here's what can happen. If too much oil is used to lubricate the piston and cylinder walls, the excess oil becomes exposed to the heat of combustion and burns. This forms sludge and carbon and causes the rings to stick with loss of compression and power. This not only wastes oil, but may also lead to expensive valve grinding or ring replacement jobs. If too little oil is allowed on the cylinder walls, excessive wear and loss of power result. These difficulties take place with ordinary oil rings when the rings develop sharp edges as they wear down. These edges then scrape all the oil off the cylinder walls. With our U-Flex ring, the narrow oil control slots remain unchanged in size throughout their life. Tests prove that they are still controlling oil flow even after 100,000 miles of use. This assures owners of lasting oil economy, plus freedom from service expense that results in further savings. 
In addition to its oil control slots, the long time effectiveness of the U-Flex ring is also due to its extreme flexibility. This enables the ring to remain in contact with the cylinder walls under all conditions of wear. Working with the U-Flex ring to produce oil economy and long engine life are the full length water jackets on all Nash engines. Water cools the cylinders right down to the bottom. This results in several advantages. The water circulating in the full length jackets helps each cylinder to warm up evenly. The cylinders then expand uniformly throughout their length and this reduces wear. The water cooled jackets also reduce the temperature of the oil as the lubricant is thrown on the lower cylinder walls. This temperature control keeps the oil in good condition and is especially important to economy and durability at high speed. All Nash engines have the water pump near the middle of the cylinder block. This is an exclusive Nash feature. It distributes the cooling water so evenly that each cylinder differs in temperature by only a few degrees. In all competitive engines, water is pumped in at the front of the block. In some cases, this means that the front cylinder receives water that is cooler than water reaching the rear. This uneven cooling produces distortion of the cylinders so that the pistons do not fit as well. The result is more wear and greater oil consumption. From what we've seen, it's obvious that both our L-head and valve head engines are of fine design. While two different valve arrangements are offered for the choice of customers, all of our engines use many of the same advanced features. All Nash engines use the same exclusive carburetor and intake manifold with high compression ratios that result in efficient combustion. Every Nash engine offers the advantages of six-cylinder design, the best balanced design for power, economy, smoothness, and durability. All our engines use heavy, well-balanced, well-supported crankshafts, and all have rubber engine mountings for additional smoothness. Every Nash engine has the same type of simple, effective exhaust manifold. All use U-Flex oil control rings, full-length water jackets, and centrally located water pumps. As a great plus value feature, the Ambassador engine has a waterproof ignition system with wires and spark plugs shielded by neoprene, insulation that gives absolute moisture-proof protection. And Nash engines all enjoy a reputation for outstanding value and for delivering the utmost in owner satisfaction. As far as prospects are concerned, that leaves just one thing to add. We've got to tell people the facts about our Nash engines. We've got to get across to prospects what our features mean to them and how our features give the greatest number of advantages to car owners. Naturally, every salesman prefers his own methods of selling. He likes to use sales procedures and conversations that he feels are best suited to him. And that's fine if it produces good sales results. We're going to listen in on a Nash salesman and his prospect, not because all sales conversations would follow the same pattern, but as a helpful reminder of the important engine features that should be presented and of some answers to competitive claims that may be brought up by the prospect. Our Nash salesman, Jim Hunter, has already gone through several steps of his sales procedure. So we'll just quickly review what he's done up till now. As soon as he could, Jim first qualified the prospect as to what the customer most wants in an automobile, how his car is principally used, whether for business or by the family, and what he is now driving. The information about the prospect and what he is most interested in has given Jim a good idea of what to show the customer and what to stress in his sales presentation. After qualifying the prospect, Jim then showed the car's features and explained how Nash would provide the benefits that the prospect was most interested in getting. Then the customer showed further interest in finding out more about the engine. So let's listen in from here. Only six cylinders, eh? Well, I've been told that an eight is better for power and runs smoother, too. Well, Mr. Crane, you might think so at first, but here are a few of the facts. Let's start with engine power. Of all the cars in the Indianapolis race each year, 
Almost every one of them uses a four-cylinder engine. These engines develop four to 500 horsepower and can do 180 miles an hour. That's real power and performance. I think you'll agree, Mr. Crane, that if these engines can develop such terrific power with only four cylinders, it can't be just a matter of how many cylinders an engine has. What each cylinder does to develop the power, that's the important thing. But I know you want other advantages, and not just power and terrific speed. One of those four-cylinder racers wouldn't satisfy you as to comfort or safety or smoothness either. It just isn't the kind of car you're after, is it, Mr. Crane? Why, no, of course not. Well, it's the same with power in a passenger car. Nash builds six-cylinder engines because they come nearest to being the all-round perfect engine. Our six-cylinder engines give you all the power you need for top performance. All the power you need for sustained speed on the highway, for fast hill climbing, and for a quick getaway. By having more than six cylinders, you wouldn't get noticeably better results as far as performance is concerned, but you definitely stand to lose a number of important advantages that only a six-cylinder engine gives. Is that so? Well, how's that? Well, more cylinders require more parts, and you know what that means. Suppose you had two more cylinders, the way they have in an eight. You either have to pay a higher price on account of all those extra parts, or you have to do without something else to keep the price down. In Nash, you get air flight construction, a more comfortable ride, lots of room, and all those other features I showed you, and at the right price, because we don't have to sacrifice in other parts of the car to offset the additional cost of extra cylinders and parts. An eight-cylinder engine requires all these extra parts, dozens of more parts than are used in our Nash engine. With more parts to wear, there's naturally higher expense for maintenance and repairs. Eight cylinders aren't needed for smoothness either, as some manufacturers claim. No, well, I thought the more cylinders, the smoother the engine. Not necessarily. Smoothness depends on the overall engine design, as well as on the number of cylinders. Our engine has many exclusive superior features that give it remarkable smoothness. For instance, our Ambassador engine has a heavy, 100% counterbalanced crankshaft supported by seven main bearings. That's important because it cuts down crankshaft vibration. If a crankshaft is not rigid enough, an engine will lack smoothness, no matter how many cylinders it has. Our Ambassador is the only American car that has a seven-bearing crankshaft. But there's another world-famous automobile that uses the same construction. The English-made Rolls-Royce, known over the years for its high standard of quality, uses a seven-bearing, completely balanced crankshaft like ours. And another remarkable fact is this. The Rolls-Royce has always used six-cylinder engines. This is one of the highest-priced cars in the world and could well afford to add more cylinders if they were necessary. Rolls-Royce built a worldwide reputation for smoothness with its six-cylinder engine. And speaking of the number of cylinders, you know, Nash made an eight-cylinder car till 1942, so our engineers are very familiar with eight-cylinder construction. Actual experience with both sixes and eights has convinced Nash that six cylinders are better because this design gives the customer greater all-round value. Why not take a ride in the car, Mr. Crane? You can see for yourself how this engine performs. Yes, that's right. There's nothing like a road demonstration to convince a prospect that the car has everything he wants. He can feel the engine's response to the gas. He can see for himself its great performance on hills and on the getaway. The prospect can experience the engine's marvelous smoothness and quietness even at high speed. He can convince himself of everything the salesman tells him about power and smoothness. But even a good road demonstration may leave the prospect with some doubts or further questions. So let's suppose he brings these up when he gets back to the sales room. Does your engine have an advanced engineering design with high compression like some of the others I've been hearing about? I'm glad you brought that up, Mr. Crane, because the advanced engineering in Nash engines is one of our really great features. Nash has been a pioneer in the field of high compression and other engine improvements. 
Ever since 1917, Nash has been a leader in the development of modern engine design. Nash engines have long had advantages which others now claim as new. Our exclusive features give power with economy and on regular gas. Here's why Nash engines give better results. Our Uniflow jet carburetor is an exclusive Nash design that gives the best mixture of gasoline and air. That's an advanced engineering feature that no one else can offer. Our sealed-in manifold is another exclusive advancement. It consists of a passage or manifold built right into the cylinder block. This manifold has water on two sides to keep the gas-air mixture at an even temperature. And that's important for good combustion. In all other engines, the intake manifold is clamped to the outside of the block. Its temperature is supposed to be controlled by a thermostatic valve, but experience shows that this valve frequently fails to work. So the gas-air mixture is not kept at an even temperature, which results in greater gas consumption and poor performance. Our engine uses a high compression ratio that's just right to get the most power and economy from the gasoline. But not such a high compression ratio that the engine won't run properly without special fuels. You should realize, Mr. Crane, that high compression alone won't give you what you want. High compression must be accompanied by other advanced engineering features. The right carburation and the right manifold design. The proof of Nash superiority is shown by this remarkable fact. You don't have to buy premium gasoline to get top performance with a Nash. Our engine uses regular gasoline. That means real economy. And that's what you want, isn't it, Mr. Crane? Yes, but uh, I thought a car gets more mileage out of premium gas and that the uh, extra mileage offsets the higher price. I'll let the engineers answer that, Mr. Crane, and they agree on this. If an engine runs without knocking on regular gas, then there's nothing to be gained by using premium gas. Many competitors' engines have to use extra-cost gasoline, and that has several disadvantages when compared to Nash. Since our engine is designed to give top performance with regular gasoline, that means a saving when you buy the gas. No extra price to pay on every gallon. Then, as the car is driven, you save again. Nash owners get the additional benefit of the utmost in operating economy. More miles to the gallon. We have many testimonials from owners to prove this. Nash gasoline economy has also been definitely proved in test after test. Nash has won many economy contests over all competition. I can show you lots of records like this one. Proof of Nash economy is found in the performance of all three great air flights in the 1951 mobile gas economy run. The Rambler, setting the all-time record of 31.05 miles per gallon, while the Ambassador with 25.92 miles per gallon and the Statesman with 26.12 miles per gallon were also trophy winners in their classes. Well, we'll let Jim Hunter carry on without us listening to the rest of his presentation. But our Nash engine story could be summed up like this. Nash has long been a leader in modern engine design and no competitive salesman can offer a prospect as much in engine value today. All Nash engines have exclusive features and advanced engineering that are responsible for their position of leadership in the industry. All Nash engines give the most of what owners want in performance, economy, smoothness, and durability. Nash engines offer the best combination of these advantages. We have the best balance design. Only Nash engines drive cars with air flight construction. Two great exclusives that make Nash the world's most modern car. So let's show our prospects how Nash will satisfy them better than any other car. Show and explain the major features, plus the fine points of our fine engines.
lot of interest in transmissions and automatic drives these days, and there are many opinions as to which kind is best. When we listen to the wants of car owners, we soon realize that everyone doesn't want exactly the same thing. In transmissions, different people prefer different features, like this. What I value most in a car is simplicity of operation. So I like an automatic drive, the kind with no clutch pedal to operate. I like a car with a transmission that gives me a good combination of real performance with maximum economy. I want a car at the lowest price. I don't mind shifting gears, and I don't care for a lot of flashy performance. I'll take the transmission that costs the least money. Yes, people do want different results from their cars and will prefer the transmission or drive that helps them get the particular results thereafter. But even though people have different preferences, they all want some combination of convenience, performance, economy, smoothness, safety, or dependability. These are basic appeals when it comes to choosing a transmission. A prospect will prefer the drive that gives him the advantages he wants. With your assistance, he'll select the transmission with a combination of benefits that appeals to him most. To meet the various preferences of different buyers, Nash offers a choice of a standard three-speed transmission and automatic overdrive on all series or hydromatic drive on the Statesman and Ambassador. Nash salesmen can offer prospects a wider choice of transmission advantages than can be obtained on any other car. But now, let's look at some basic transmission principles that'll help us explain our advantages to prospects. We'll start with a simplified car, having its engine connected directly to the propeller shaft. The engine, propeller shaft, rear axles and wheels would all turn together because this car has no clutch or transmission. Since there is no clutch, the engine would be stalled every time the car is stopped and it would be a problem to get the car and engine started again. A driving arrangement without clutch or transmission would be economical to build and would therefore lower the price of the car. But the car would lack convenience, performance, smoothness and safety and wouldn't satisfy owners no matter how much they could save in buying it. When a clutch is installed in the driving system, the car can be stopped and the engine kept running. The clutch provides a means of connecting and disconnecting the engine from the propeller shaft and rear wheels. But a car with a clutch and no transmission would have only one speed. The car would always be in direct drive, like a car always in the high gear of a standard three-speed transmission. We all realize what happens when we try to drive by using the clutch and high gear only. When a car is started off in direct drive or high gear, the engine must be speeded up to increase its power and prevent stalling. Then, by carefully releasing the clutch and letting it slip while stepping hard on the gas, the car can be set in motion. Starting a car with a clutch but with no transmission would be like starting a car in high gear. It would waste gas and overheat the clutch because of the excessive slipping and high engine speeds. The clutch wouldn't last very long under these conditions, and the starts would be pretty rough. Of course, there'd always be a big chance of stalling, and there are other problems too. If the car gets into a hole, the engine might not have enough torque or twisting force to turn the propeller shaft and the rear wheels, so the car wouldn't move at all. But even after a car gets underway in direct drive, it may slow down or even stop completely on a steep hill. The engine doesn't have sufficient torque to keep the wheels turning. Engine torque needs to be increased, and that's what a transmission is for. If we fasten a small gear so that it's driven by the engine and clutch, and fasten a larger gear to the propeller shaft, we have a simple transmission with one speed. The engine's power will now be transmitted to the propeller shaft and rear wheels through this pair of gears. And here's how that helps. Let's say that the large gear on the propeller shaft is three times as big as the small gear driven by the engine. 
This gives a gear ratio of three to one, something like first or low gear in an ordinary transmission. With a gear ratio of three to one, the engine turns three times to turn the propeller shaft once. The engine now has three times the speed of the shaft, but the shaft has three times the torque of the engine. Let's see how different gear ratios in a transmission affect the speed and torque with which the car is driven. We all know from experience that when a car is in low speed or first gear, the engine runs fast but the car is moved slowly. The car is given great pulling ability, plenty of torque at the rear wheels, but not much speed for making time on the highway. As we shift into second, we change the gear ratio. The engine now drives the wheels faster than in first, but with less torque or pulling ability. Second gear is good for fast acceleration and hill climbing because it combines a medium torque with a fair amount of speed. In high speed or direct drive, the engine's revolutions are not geared down. The rear wheels turn faster than the engine speed, but with less torque than in the lower gears, making high gear especially suited for cruising and fast travel. Now, here's the important thing about all drives and transmissions. A shift in gears changes both the torque and the speed with which the engine's power is transmitted to the rear wheels. Torque, or pulling ability, goes down as we shift up into faster speeds. A transmission is ordinarily called by the number of speeds it has. For example, a three-speed transmission. It could just as well be called a three-torque transmission because for every change in speed as the gears are shifted, there's also a change in torque to the rear wheels. The main job of all transmissions is to take the engine's power and change or convert it into different combinations of torque and speed as required by the driving conditions. Now, there are two other gears that are very important in connection with the transmission of power, the ring and the pinion of the rear axle. The size of the ring gear compared to the size of the pinion determines the axle ratio. The higher the axle ratio, the higher the torque or turning effort given to the rear wheels. But of course, the speed of turning the wheels is reduced. This follows the rule in power transmission that whenever torque is increased, speed is decreased. A high axle ratio, like four to one, delivers a higher torque to the rear wheels than a lower ratio like three to one. But as usual, the higher ratio will not turn the wheels as fast. With a higher axle ratio, the engine has to make more turns for every turn of the rear wheels. The engine has to make more revolutions to drive the car a mile. For example, an axle ratio of four to one may require 3,200 engine revolutions to drive the car a mile. The same car, with a ratio of three to one, would require only three-fourths the number of revolutions, 2,400 per mile. More engine revolutions per mile give the car more pulling ability, but less speed. The car's hill climbing and accelerating qualities are improved. Raising the axle ratio is like shifting into a lower gear in the transmission. Although a car's performance on hills and getaway is improved by a higher axle ratio, gasoline mileage goes down because of the increased engine revolutions per mile. Axle ratios are therefore arranged to give the best all-around results, the best balance of torque, speed, and economy to suit a particular car and the transmission being used. Both the axle ratio and the transmission affect how the engine's power is transmitted to the rear wheels. The principles of power transmission apply to automatic and hydraulic drives as well as to standard transmissions. The purpose of all types is to control the speed and torque of the power carried to the wheels. All transmissions are speed converters and torque converters. 
While it's the transmission's job to convert power into the best combination of torque and speed to meet different driving conditions, the most important part of the whole story is this. A transmission should drive the car in a way that best satisfies the owner. It should give each owner the advantages that interest him the most. And since different buyers want different results, Nash offers a choice from which anyone can select the results he prefers. The Nash transmissions offer a wide variety of torque and speed combinations that give different driving results. Let's check into the advantages of each type so that we can help any prospect choose the transmission that will give him the most satisfaction as a Nash owner. To begin with, we should realize what a great selling advantage we have in being able to offer such a wide choice of transmissions. It puts us far out in front of our competition, for car buyers have shown they like the choice of three types of transmissions. There are many prospects who still like the idea of shifting gears in the conventional manner they've been used to. For those who do most of their driving in traffic, the standard transmission gives a very good combination of gasoline economy and performance. Its gear and axle ratios are well suited for conditions that require frequent stopping, starting, and restricted speeds. Nash cars with standard transmissions all offer the convenience of the clutch pedal starter. This is a safety feature too, since depressing the clutch to start the engine reduces the danger of accidentally starting in gear. Nash cars equipped with automatic overdrive also have clutch pedal starting. Overdrive, optional on all series at extra cost, offers many special advantages of its own. Overdrive is attached to the rear of a standard transmission and adds an automatic fourth gear. The automatic feature offers the driver a choice of two ratios, the overdrive for best gasoline mileage and the overtake for faster acceleration. In cars equipped with overdrive, an axle ratio is selected which gives exceptionally fine performance for getaway acceleration on the highway and for hill climbing in third gear. When overdrive automatically shifts into fourth or high gear, engine speed is reduced so that engine revolutions become 30% less than those of the same car in standard high or conventional third gear. This has several advantages. Obviously, the reduced engine revolutions in fourth gear with overdrive mean less engine wear, better oil mileage, and a smoother, quieter ride, especially at high speeds. Furthermore, when cruising in overdrive, the lower engine speed results in a fuel saving of 10 to 25 percent, three to five miles per gallon when compared to a car in conventional high gear. The automatic overtake, affecting a shift from fourth to third by merely pressing the accelerator to the floor, is both a convenience and a safety feature. Overtake, or third gear of overdrive, makes possible a fast increase in engine output for quickly passing another car on the highway or for meeting any other situation that calls for extra torque and power. Overdrive certainly makes a strong appeal by its convenience, performance, and economy, and by its smoothness at cruising speeds. Especially for those who drive a great deal on the highways, overdrive offers many benefits. Now let's consider hydromatic, which consists of a fluid coupling and a completely automatic four-speed transmission. It is optional on the Ambassador and Statesman, but not on the Rambler. On Nash with Hydromatic, convenience is increased by our exclusive Selecto lift starting. And it is extra safe too, because the engine can't be started in gear. Of course, the great convenience of Hydromatic comes from its completely automatic shifting, with no clutch to operate. Hydromatic is always in the right gear for the driving situation. After the engine has been started, Hydromatic requires only two operations to get into high gear, setting the selector lever and stepping on the gas. This is a great convenience over the three-speed transmission 
that requires 14 operations for getting into high. Further convenience results from Hydromatic's fluid coupling, which takes the place of the conventional clutch and makes it impossible to stall the engine. Even inexperienced drivers can make smooth starts every time. Hydromatic's fluid coupling, with its smooth flow of power, means reduced wear on all parts of the driving system, including the rear tires. When it comes to performance, Hydromatic is in a class by itself especially for fast getaway, hill climbing, and passing. There are several reasons behind this. Hydromatic has extra low gearing in first and second, which provides lots of torque for fast getaway, and the shifting is done automatically at just the right time. Nash Hydromatic uses four gear ratios automatically, while many competitive automatic transmissions use only two or three in the driving range. An even greater acceleration is available in first and second gears with Hydromatic, if the driver wants it, by simply stepping harder on the accelerator. This delays the shifts and keeps those lower gears engaged longer, which means faster pickup. Hydromatic's third gear gives an especially fine combination of torque and speed for fast hill climbing and passing cars on the highway. A downshift from fourth to third is accomplished by simply pushing the accelerator to the floor. For those who are particularly interested in convenience, performance, and smoothness in starting and shifting, for those who are willing to pay more to get the utmost in these advantages, Hydromatic makes its strongest appeal. Now that we've seen the main advantages of each Nash transmission, let's compare them. Let's check the main appeals of each type against the wants of different buyers. In discussing Nash transmissions, it should be realized that all three are good designs and that the main interest of prospects is to learn what results they'll get as car owners. All three Nash transmissions are completely tried and proved products. All are thoroughly dependable and will give long, trouble-free service. All provide safe operation under any operating conditions. So, we'll limit our consideration to convenience, performance, economy, and smoothness. And we'll see how each type stacks up on these appeals. When it comes to convenience, Hydromatic rates tops because it's automatic shifting with no clutch to operate. For traffic driving with its frequent need for shifting, this convenience is valued by many owners, especially by women. Next in convenience is overdrive, since it acts like an automatic transmission in shifting between third and fourth, which are the shifts most frequently made. But here's another customer's viewpoint to keep in mind. Don't forget people like me. I don't need the automatic shifting. I prefer to shift gears myself, the way I've always been used to. All right, now let's go on to performance. In performance, too, Hydromatic rates very high. It's low gearing, it's full power flow during shifting, and the control timing of each shift means flashing getaway, powerful acceleration, and terrific hill climbing ability. Yes, but I like the kind of performance I get with overdrive. There's plenty of get up and go in that third gear, and it's easy to cut in and out of automatic overtake. But what I especially like about overdrive is the smooth, fast cruising on the highway, the smoothness that comes from reduced engine speed. And when it comes to economy, my Nash with overdrive will beat anything on the road for gasoline mileage. The lower engine speed cuts down engine wear and oil consumption too. An overdrive costs me less to buy than a fully automatic transmission. Yes, many people prefer overdrive because it gives a good balance of advantages. It combines the benefits of some automatic shifting and the lower cost, plus smooth, economical highway performance. But speaking of smoothness, we'll have to give Hydromatic top rating for smooth, easy starts with its fluid coupling, plus freedom from stalling. But here's a point in favor of the standard transmission. Yeah, don't forget that the regular transmission is the lowest in price and that in traffic, it probably gives better gas economy. These two points make a big appeal to a lot of people like me. Right you are. 
So in selling the right transmission to each prospect, we first have to find out what the prospect wants, how he uses his car, the kind of driving he does, and the results that interest him the most. After qualifying the prospect, decide which Nash transmission gives the most of the advantages the prospect is after. Then stress those advantages in presenting and demonstrating the car. Helping each prospect to select the right transmission for his own needs will help make the sale. It will show the buyer how he can get the greatest satisfaction as a Nash owner. Let's take advantage of this great selling fact. Nash has a transmission to suit every need. Thank you.